Uh, well, uh, good morning and good afternoon, good evening for those of you who are also um, joining us uh, through live stream. My name is Ana Rojas. I am the Senior Gender and Climate Change Advisor for IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And it is an absolute pleasure to welcome you today to our event, Realizing Rights and Resilience for All, which we are co-hosting uh, with the GCF, with the Green Climate Fund. Uh, we have a really nice lineup of speakers for the morning, and we hope we're going to keep you engaged, and we'll be looking forward to also uh, your questions. So without further ado, because we have a very, very tight agenda, today is Gender Day at the, at the COP26, uh, I would like to invite our first speaker, um, Ms. Carolina Fuentes. Ms. Carolina Fuentes is the Secretary of the Board and Head of Governance Affairs at DCF, where she is responsible for the provision of support across the governance structure of the DCF. She was formerly Deputy Director General of the International Cooperation at the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources in Mexico and was Director for Climate Change in the same ministry, where she represented Mexico in international climate change negotiations. Um, Ms. Fuentes holds a master's degree in nature society and environmental policy from uh, the University of Oxford. Bienvenida, gracias. Muchas gracias, and it is an honor for me to be speaking also in this very important day, a gender day at COP. Uh, there cannot be an inclusive uh, response to climate change in, if gender is not part of the response. So the gender day uh, really goes to the core of uh, climate action and also the decisions that are to be taken as part of this uh, conference. So many thanks and very honored to be part also of this uh, very distinguished panel. Just to mention also that we are very proud at GCF uh, to have a, an expert team uh, that is working on the environmental and social aspects of the climate change response. And as part of that, we also have a gender expert. I'm extremely thankful to my colleagues also for preparing the, the inputs for this uh, intervention. Uh, given the fact that they were not able to be here uh, due to the size constraints of the delegation. I hope to do some justice as well to the very hard and very productive work uh, they're doing. As part of the uh, uh, response to climate change, we consider in the GCF uh, that gender respons responsive climate action is the only uh, way for us to address climate change. As the world's uh, largest uh, dedicated climate fund, uh, the GCF recognizes uh, that climate change has an impact on women and men in a differentiated manner. In this regard, it is important for us also to acknowledge and be mindful of this differentiated impact on women, both in terms of the manifestations of climate change, but also of the response measures to climate change. When it comes to the manifestations, of course, we know that uh, women, uh, given the role that they play in the household and in the society, they uh, tend to rely, we tend to rely more on natural resources, water, uh, land, agriculture. All of these uh, resources uh, will be under increased uh, pressure due to climate change, and th that will have an impact on the role of women in the household and in the society. Also, some of the response measures to climate change involve uh, new uh, market and financial uh, mechanisms, and we know that there is a financial gap when it comes to the participation of women in the climate response. So that gap also may uh, hinder uh, the engagement of women if they are not considered in a, uh, from the outset as part of the response to climate change and as part of the projects and programs that address uh, the matter. So that is the rationale as well uh, behind uh, the policy to incorporate and mainstream gender considerations in the GCF right from the outset of the design of projects. We think uh, that is uh, 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 crucial. And also uh, women uh, need to be part of the response all throughout the project cycle, from the design uh, to the conceptualization to the part of implementation very importantly. And last but not least, uh, when it comes as well uh, to the um, uh, monitoring of the impacts on the ground. And of course, they need to be beneficiaries of climate action. The GCF uh, believes uh, that uh, gender equality in our response to climate change is one of the most effective mechanisms we have towards creating a low emissions, climate resilient, and uh, inclusive future for all of us. 
This ensures as well that all investments on mitigation and adaptation are also uh, geared towards uh, enhancing the participation of women. And given the fact that the GCF has a gender policy, this is also something that is to be considered by our accredited entities when implementing funding proposals. We hope that this also has a multiplier effect. So this also uh, will shape the behavior of our partners when it comes uh, to the design and implementation and lastly monitoring of climate action. So this multiplier effect is also something that the GCF is pursuing through the network of partners uh, that we have. We are um, one of the first uh, climate finance mechanisms uh, to mainstream a gender perspective right from the outset, as mentioned, of the operations and as an essential uh, decision-making element for the deployment of the GCF uh, resources. Uh, gender mainstreaming is central uh, to our objectives and guiding principles, including through engaging women of all ages and as, as stakeholders in uh, our funding proposals. For instance, our updated gender policy acknowledges that climate change initiatives are more sustainable, equitable, and more likely to achieve objectives when gender and women's empowerment considerations are integrated into the design and implementation of projects. Also, uh, we uh, seek as part of our projects that uh, there are improved access uh, to finance and to job opportunities uh, for uh, women. So it is not only about um, having them uh, being part of the design of the project, but as well uh, having women as direct uh, beneficiaries and as part also of the decision making uh, when it comes to the implementation of projects. Climate finance uh, can ensure that gender equality and women's empowerment are systematically incorporated as we address uh, climate action. And uh, for us, uh, it is also uh, very important that uh, we uh, pay very close attention to any potential impact of the uh, climate uh, response and of the fund funds uh, that we deploy on uh, the current situation of uh, women and vulnerable uh, groups. And this is already anchored as well in on our updated strategic plan and in our uh, gender policy. We also want to uh, speak about some of the examples of the action that we have taken on, on the ground uh, just to finalize uh, the intervention and to give a, a more human touch as well uh, to how the gender response is implemented in the GCF. Uh, just to speak of one of our projects in uh, Jordan, uh, where uh, GCF is financing also the efficient use of water in agriculture by recycling uh, waste water and collect, collecting drain uh, water. Uh, women play a critical role in the use of uh, water and in the agriculture sector in uh, Jordan. And as part of this uh, project, uh, they are trained uh, to be uh, climate-wise agents so they can uh, support as well uh, climate resilient agriculture practices. Uh, they are trained for that. And also uh, they are trained uh, to conduct and develop agribusinesses that can also help uh, with income. Uh, we think this is uh, key. Uh, so we uh, rely on the role of women as agents of a uh, change uh, to support in the implementation of the projects. And of course, uh, women are the primary managers of water in the household and more broadly in, in society. Another uh, very good example uh, we have in Morocco, uh, the GCF uh, has been supporting uh, women-led uh, cooperatives in sustainable managing the world's only biosphere of argan uh, trees to reduce emissions, enhance adaptation, and boost uh, the livelihood benefits by improving access uh, to the global market profits uh, of argan oil. Uh, this is also very important because uh, here in this project, we're relying also on the role that uh, women have traditionally played in making use of the argan oil uh, resource, but now in an enhanced uh, manner and also in a way that can uh, deliver profit uh, to the communities. Uh, lastly, uh, we have a project in uh, Liberia uh, to build a rock revetment to protect uh, the west point of Monrovia against coastal erosion. Uh, very importantly, uh, well, this project is providing uh, services uh, such as uh, child uh, care, so women can also engage uh, uh, as part of the implementation of the project. Uh, and also uh, something that is uh, very positive in this project is that there is also a program 
for engaging uh, boys in community discussions to develop gender champions. Uh, that is also uh, very helpful uh, because we are trying through this project uh, to have a, a, a also a voice as part of the response and helping support efforts to address a gender-based uh, violence in the household and communities and also uh, to uh, promote uh, this uh, gender sensitive and responsive practice as a uh, part of the society. So this is part of the work uh, that GCF is uh, supporting and we uh, hope uh, that this is only a basis uh, to replicate uh, more efforts and to uh, promote a gender responsive response to climate change. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Ms. Fuentes. And it's really, I want to thank you truly for bringing in that human face into climate change, um, especially during the, at the negotiation uh, rooms, we hear a lot about tables and numbers, forgetting about the fact that climate change is all about livelihoods and improvement and being us humans living inside this, this earth. So thank you very much for bringing that perspective. And with that, I would like to invite um, Ms. Asa Regner, um, who is from UN Women. Uh, Ms. Regner serves as Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and Deputy Executive Director of UN Women since May of 2018. Uh, Ms. Regner served uh, since 2014 as Minister for Children, the Elderly, and Gender Equality of Sweden, where her focus was on concrete results in the implementation of Swedish gender equality policies, as well as a shift toward prevention of violence against women and the involvement of men and boys in gender equality work. Uh, Mick Regner, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. I'm very sure we'll also hear about intersectionality somehow, uh, because I cannot see that not coming through, uh, through your bio. So uh, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, follow, uh, fellow panelists. Thank you, everybody who's here today. And most of all, thank you to everybody representing uh, NGOs who are very uh, are bravely uh, advocating for change when it comes to women's and girls' rights in relation to, gender, uh, to climate change. So as we heard already, climate change does affect everyone and it really is about people. Um, but we also know that it's the world's poorest and those in the most vulnerable situations. And among those, women and girls are mostly overrepresented. They bear the brunt of environmental and socioeconomic shocks. UN Women has programs and or full-fledged offices in 80 countries in the world. And through them, we meet every day with women from all the regions who are in one way or the other affected by climate change. That can be in Latin America, in the Amazon region or in coastal regions. And I think we'll hear more about um, uh, compelling examples uh, of that. It can be the Sahel, as you know, big parts of West, uh, Western Africa where climate change sparks or fuels conflicts. It can be farmer herder conflicts and other conflicts where climate change is very instrumental, unfortunately. Uh, it's about agriculture in big parts of the world. It can be women in the Pacific um, experiences, floodings, and all of these women need their livelihoods just as men do, but it's often affected by climate change as we just uh, heard. So we see it as our role to uh, support women with these experiences who want to prevent, who want to work, who want to influence uh, decision making to support them in every way we can. Uh, and I believe this needs to be a growing part of what you and women does uh, and to always work together with those who are experts and have lived these experiences. Uh, we also know, obviously, that during COVID-19, pre-existing inequalities and difficulties worsened. Uh, and we have seen throughout the world that women have more and more, unfortunately, experienced gender-based violence. We also know that the COVID pandemic increased the uh, burden of unpaid work, which was already on women's and sometimes girls' shoulders. Uh, 
when we have seen job losses and when women lost their jobs during the COVID-19 pandemic, they, to a much larger extent than men, did not have uh, unemployment benefits or health care insurances, uh, etc. So this led to economic insecurity and all of this disproportionately affected women and girls. And the climate change, which is happening at the same, the effects of the climate change, um, which are happening at the same time, exacerbates the inequalities that we saw already. So therefore, it's very important what member states do. And uh, I have been representing a member state before, so I know that when you are in cabinet, you do have a lot of responsibility, but also a lot of power. And you should see the people who are affected by what you do. And we know when it comes to gender equality in general in the world, a big reason for gender equality not having progressed, regardless of its root causes, is because governments have not invested in women and girls uh, and in um, uh, issues that would close the uh, gender uh, gaps. So therefore, nationally determined contributions are very important for ensuring that gender equality is centered also within climate actions. And women and girls obviously should have control over productive and natural resources, and they should be in control of and have access to finance, technology, land, that's a big issue, land rights, and strategic decision making uh, everywhere. We should also acknowledge that women and girls are often victims of, um, as I said, both inequalities and violence caused by or sparked by climate change, but women need and have the right to be decision makers, uh, perhaps uh, most importantly. We see, however, in inequalities present all across all sectors uh, in relation to energy, agriculture, as I said, water infrastructure, very important, and education in order to be able to be, become a decision maker uh, in some of these areas. Um, So we also believe that uh, it's important for us to support all of you in relation to decision making on at local, national and international uh, levels. What we do see from you and women in relation to uh, NGOs conditions, both climate activists as well as gender equality activists and those who bear both of these issues, is that on the one hand there is increasing understanding from governments for the importance of these issues. Uh, and I think this, this conference is one example of that. On the other hand, we see a lack of implementation and commitment in, in real terms. And we see more and more of shrinking space for activism in many countries. So this makes it increasingly dangerous for these brave activists to speak out. That is also a big task, we believe, from UN Women's uh, side to support whatever we can together with the rest of the UN system to support and protect uh, advocates for these important democratic issues and for us to help make visible the multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination against uh, women and girls. To close, I also wanted to say that we have, um, from you and women's uh, side, um, a, a tradition of data collection and spreading, and we think that's important in this area too, because data is lacking. We have preliminary data as one example from our Asia-Pacific office, which is leading when it comes to gender and climate change data, that, for example, when climate change causes catastrophes in different ways, we we tend to see that child marriage increases as uh, an effect of those changes uh, on, of those uh, catastrophes, as one example. So data is very important. We have also taken the initiatives through the Generation Equality uh, Forum and initiative in one of the six action coalitions, which is the one on climate justice, 
where we uh, have together with civil society, member states and experts come out with action points to go forward when it comes to gender and climate and we are really hope that you would like to engage in that. I also want to point out that the Commission on the Status of Women, which is a traditional intergovernmental uh, UN body, is actually the biggest meeting, uh, UN meeting for women in the world every year and it's the UN's second biggest meeting after the General Assembly. It takes place in March and this year Years, or the coming year's topic is um, gender equality and climate change in different aspects. So I invite you all to engage in that. So thank you so much for having me. Sorry to speak a bit long. <laughs> and uh, I'm very, very happy to be here and to work with you. One, two, oh, there you go. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Regner. It's been uh, fabulous listening to you, uh, to the examples of, of you and women, and also to those calls, uh, both for action, for ensuring participation, and for data collection. And I'm going to use that as a sideway to the next part of our agenda of today. Um, as Ms. Fuente said, because of the pandemic and the restrictions on the delegations, I should have said uh, to you that I was wearing a few hats myself this morning. And as not only as uh, I'm, I'm with you, not only as MC, but also as one of the presenters. So I wanted to invite you um, to look up on the screens, or for those of you on the live stream, just keep on watching your screen, please, um, and ask for the presentation to be put up. Because one of the things that we wanted to do today at Gender Day is launch the latest uh, report on findings of gender mainstreaming into the updated NDCs. Um, and this is done by IUCN. Uh, and I forgot, I also have to do the clicking. Oh, that's, you want to sit there? Oh, it's perfect, thank you. Let's see, there you go. For those of you who do not know us, um, IUCN is International Union for Conservation of Nature. It is the um, oldest intergovernmental agency uh, working on environment. And as part of that, uh, we're on, not only engaged for decades on understanding biodiversity and the co its conservation, but we've also had one of the longest standing gender teams. Um, and at intergovernmental organizations. Uh, we also have a very interesting membership because um, both ministries of, foreign, of environment, uh, but also civil society and academia are part of the union. So we have a very interesting way of communicating and conducting research. And as part of the gender team, of course, we're all about understanding those data gaps, that information that is out there, and trying to feed that into policy making. Hence, uh, our report of today. And what is it that we wanted to do first? Well, one of the things we wanted to research was if there was a difference between what happened about five to six years ago with the NDCs and what we're finding today. And we see, uh, as you can see, that right now, and this is a, a sample from uh, September 20, uh, 1st of September of this year, we see that there is um, a larger number of NDCs that are including gender equality. So um, you see that from the, from the 67 uh, NDCs that are out there, um, 69, I'm sorry, um, were addressing gender equality. In contrast to 2016, this means that not only numerically, but only also in terms of percentage, we see a shift. There is a larger number of NDCs that are actually including gender equality in their text. What does this mean? That now that those countries that have taken the time to update their NDCs and increase their ambition, it looks like this ambition is also, and I see uh, the panelists looking at the screen, so if you want to step down and to have a better view, that's okay. Uh, what we are seeing is that NDCs are also increasing their ambitions in terms of addressing gender equality. And we also see that there are some interesting trends region-wise. And of course, we want to put those who are doing good uh, in, the, 
in the, in the spotlight. So uh, we see, for example, that at least from the indices presented by September 1st of this year, 100% of those coming from the Latin American Caribbean region were addressing gender equality. That was, and as a Latina myself, that was a very nice surprise because in 2016, we were not doing that well. We were actually lagging quite behind. And I think that the other very interesting difference that we've seen between this round of NDCs and their previous iterations is that we see gender equality is no longer seen as a developing country issue. Because for the first time, we're seeing that developed countries are also addressing gender equality in the text of their NDCs. Half of those who have presented NDCs um, have addressed gender equality. We also see that Sub-Saharan Africa keeps on being quite uh, strong in terms of addressing gender equality. Uh, in the 2016 review, they were by far the region with the most uh, mentions. Uh, and for those of you who are used to IUCN's gender reports, you will see that we tend to categorize uh, women uh, or, or see how women are perceived in different policy uh, documents in four different categories. And again, just to make the contrast with that from five years ago, we are seeing that the mentions of women as stakeholders is coming up stronger in this round uh, of NDCs which was not necessarily the case uh, for the first round, where women were seen as vulnerable in most of the cases, which is something that when we're thinking about gender equality, perhaps is the first thing that we tend to think of, right? Oh, these poor women who maybe cannot defend themselves, we need to help them. And that perception is shifting, and perhaps the most important shift has come in terms of acknowledging women as agents of change. We see Five years ago, there were only two NDCs that were making this reference, and we see that now it's 18%. So there um, is a very important shift in terms of the vision and ambitions. And the other thing, as we were mentioning before, is how do you ensure implementation? How do we make sure that these calls for gender equality are not just staying in terms of objectives, which is something that we saw very strongly in the first round of NDCs. So the team decided to think about what could be those elements that would ensure gender responsiveness, right? So how can we ensure that we are walking uh, the talk? And we saw that there are quite a lot of elements coming up that ensure implementation. So whether it is uh, the use of gender analysis or the commitment to produce those, uh, the investment in, in gender um, monitoring systems, but also the engagement even with the gender machineries at home, and the identification of activities. So we see that perhaps the most important is still the acknowledgement of gender equality as an objective uh, within the NDCs, but this is very closely followed by uh, identification of gender actions and activities, and sometimes even um, there is mentions of gender budgeting. So we do see that there are more elements that are signaling implementation. And if you think that eight elements for evaluating gender responsiveness is too much, and that's impossible um, to have them all, uh, well, it was very nice for us to see that we had at least two countries from those who had presented their NDCs by uh, 1st of September that actually scored well in all of these elements. And those, um, as you can see on the screen, are Cambodia and Moldova. So we hope that this could also be a map for those countries who are thinking, okay, so how do I do this? Um, another change, and I'll go faster with this one, is that we see that there is also more indication of women in different sectors. So um, the mentions of women in relation to adaptation continue to be um, high, but we see perhaps the, the highest shift when uh, it comes to the mitigation sections. Five years ago, we only saw five, three, excuse me, three NDCs mentioning gender in their mitigation section. Well, we see now that at least 16% are doing these mentions on gender. And for me, and hopefully for you, this is even more interesting. Because when we go down into the sectors, we see also that the mentions to gender equality are not only uh, in those that are relations to um, adaptation, so for example, agriculture or water, 
But I want to invite you to look at the energy mentions. It's 25% uh, of those uh, NDCs were actually thinking about women in energy. There are mentions to gender equality in infrastructure, um, also on transport. So we are, again, trying to see about progress. We're seeing this shift uh, more into those sectors that were considered too difficult, too technical, to have this uh, incursion. So it's very interesting to see um, the shift. And we also looked into different intersectionalities. And it was very interesting to see that these NDCs are also, which they didn't necessarily do in the first round, addressing uh, in a stronger manner um, the rights of indigenous peoples and the recognition of also indigenous women in their text. Uh, youth, with 46 of these NDCs mentioning youth, and even uh, six NDCs mentioning the rights and the involvement and the vulnerabilities of all uh, LGBTQ plus uh, groups. So that's also an interesting shift. We are seeing it's not only about gender equality, but acknowledging different intersectionalities um, in this text. And finally, <laughs> to give the, the floor to our next speaker, just wanted to leave you with a few ideas of how or what came up of, in terms of us from, from this report. And it is the, the fact that we're hoping that by sharing this uh, information and also highlighting some of these cases, um, textual uh, cases in the report, that other countries and organizations can also draw inspiration of what is possible. Um, we hope that also by addressing or identifying some of these gender responsiveness elements, um, one could go further into implementation and also encourage uh, parties and organizations to work together because this means that there is a lot of capacity building that needs to happen on the ground if we really want to make this work. And finally, we do hope that this report could help especially parties, to report and provide submissions on how they're dealing with their um, commitments under the Lima Work Program on Gender and its Gender Action Plan. And with that, I uh, want to thank you for your attention and invite our next speaker um, to the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, and now it is my absolute pleasure to invite Ms. Jennifer Ying Corpus. <laughs> uh, Ms. Corpus uh, is from the Kankana Ye Igorot people of Mountain Province in the Philippines. And apologies because I've seriously mispronounced it, I'm sure. Um, she's a lawyer by profession and is the global policy and advocacy lead for NIA Terra. She is the former coordinator of the Indigenous Peoples' Rights and Policy Advocacy Program of Tepteba Indigenous Peoples International Center for Policy Research and Education. Uh, is passionate about developing capacities of the next generation of Indigenous peoples. And she graduated from the UP College of Law and obtained her master's in law from the Indigenous Peoples' Law and Policy IPLP program of the University of Arizona and Tucson, Arizona. You have an impressive CV. I'm going to leave it there, but I invite all our, our audience to look into it. And most importantly, very much looking forward to hearing about your experience about indigenous peoples and women's and climate action. Welcome. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak about indigenous peoples and indigenous women in particular. And I think it's very interesting what you showed in one of your last slides that 19% of NDCs um, mention indigenous peoples and indigenous women in some. Um, and of course, the goal is to increase that. Um, we hope that you know, eventually it, it will become more than 19%. Um, and this is particularly because, um, as we've probably heard all over the, the, uh, the COP um, premises, indigenous peoples maintain 80% of the world's forest biodiversity. Um, they're, 
indigenous peoples also play a very significant role in, um, in maintaining the forests, in maintaining traditional knowledge, and in passing on traditional knowledge to the next generation. And as we've said, this is no surprise because indigenous peoples have a spiritual and very reciprocal relational uh, relationship with nature. Um, and this is largely because of the role of indigenous women within the communities. So indigenous women are, are the knowledge keepers. Indigenous women are those that manage the um, biodiversity within indigenous territories. And indigenous women have the, uh, the responsibility of passing on all of these values and this knowledge to the next generation, um, to the children. Um, so, and this has been confirmed by recent assessments, no? The IPBES assessment that says that um, the biodiversity is declining everywhere, but at a much slower rate in indigenous peoples' territories. And the IPCC assessment that finds that traditional knowledge could play a very important role, but that they have to learn, scientists have to learn how to work with traditional knowledge. Um, so maybe I just wanted to share some of my uh, experiences from my people, the Kankana'i Igorot people. So unfortunately for many indigenous peoples, it is still um, the men that take up the leadership positions. So the term for the indigenous um, uh, governance structure in my community, the Kankana'i Igorot, is Amam'a. It means old men or lalakai. So it's, um, it's the men that are normally part of the governance structure. Um, however, when we see um, you know, uh, projects, activities that threaten our community, it is the babakut um, or the women that are in the front lines of resisting these, um, these activities. I'll give you an example from a long time ago in my community. There was a World Bank, uh, the World Bank uh, funded a, a project, a dam project in our community. Of course, the Lalakai, the Amam'a, the men, um, entered into peace pacts among the neighboring uh, indigenous communities in order to resist the, the project. But in the end, it was the Babakut, the women, that um, actually went to the front lines and um, barricaded the, the equipment. No, So this, this dam was prevented from happening, and in fact, it's part of the history that this um, this uh, project was one of the reasons why the World Bank adopted an indigenous people's policy. So from these experiences, you know, it's very important for indigenous women to be recognized as leaders. Um, we have programs that um, support capacity building for women. However, it's also very important because indigenous peoples are highly colonized. No, we, we've been facing colonization for centuries. So it's important that this is not perceived as something that is imposed from, from outside. Therefore, it's important that the capacities of indigenous people, uh, women are built and that dialogue um, is initiated between indigenous men and indigenous women. So also um, similar to um, what was mentioned earlier, it's also important to, to um, sensitize the boys, you know, the young men. And that's um, one of the approaches that we've found has been very effective in the communities in strengthening um, indigenous women. And then um, there are many projects now that enter indigenous communities, and we are very happy to see that a lot of them are, um, are directed towards um, including, well, indigenous women's projects, but also in the territorial projects in general, we find that if indigenous women are included in the, uh, the decision-making process, in the governance of the project, the projects are more um, transparent. No, and the projects reach the grassroots better if indigenous women are involved. So, um, so these, all of these things should be taken into account also when countries develop NDCs. And what we are doing now is um, identifying opportunities for both indigenous men and indigenous women to be engaged with the government in, their, in the process of developing and, more importantly, implementing the NDCs. Because as we said, as the st statistics and the studies show it's impossible to ignore indigenous peoples and especially indigenous women in um, in crafting solutions to both the biodiversity problem and uh, uh, climate challenges 
So I'll stop there and, you know, just hope that the statistic that you flashed increases. It's not just 19% a few years from now or maybe at the next COP. We hope it's 50%, 80%. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Corpus. Um, and indeed, uh, it would be very nice to see those statistics growing. And uh, I have the feeling, knowing how strong the, the indigenous people's uh, groups are here, and the caucus particularly, how vocal you are, I'm pretty sure you'll get there. So <laughs> it's a matter of time, but I ho we hope it's, it's a short lived. Um, next in our program, first I need to apologize because one of our uh, speakers um, has run uh, late. Um, but if, if it's okay with you, then I want to invite you all to listen to a video that we have from colleagues from Guatemala who were unable to attend uh, again because of the pandemic restrictions. But we hope um, that through their voices and um, their commentaries that you can also hear how implementation can happen on the ground, just as Ms. Corpus uh, was sharing with us. So um, if we could start the video. Thank you. My name is Raquel Siguenza. I am the IUCN's country representative in Guatemala. Hi, my name is Jill Bader, and I am a grants manager at IUCN in Guatemala. Hola. Mi nombre es Marisela Méndez, soy oficial técnico y manejo integrado de cuencas en UICN Guatemala. Hola, mi nombre es Lourdes Goy, soy especialista en género e inclusión social del proyecto Ayudando Resiliente de la UICN. The Resilient Highland Project looks to enhance the resilience of communities and ecosystems in the Guatemalan Highlands in the face of climate change. Extreme climate events like droughts and floods are already a reality in this region and greatly affect local livelihoods. Through this project, we are promoting practices that allow conserving natural resources and be better prepared to face these extreme events. I am in charge of awarding funds to community-based organizations in the Guatemala Highlands to support local climate change adaptation actions. With these funds, we want to invest in livelihoods, ecology, and economic sustainability, especially agriculture, and restore forest ecosystems. If you ask people in Guatemala, most of them would say that this is men's responsibility. Women's role in agriculture and natural resource management lacks recognition. However, they do play a specific role in nature conservation. For instance, women hold their traditional land knowledge about medicinal plants, they also act as an important part of the agricultural value chain by transforming and selling products. Women play a very specific role in natural resources management and productive activities. They are often in charge of providing water for their household as well as firewood. They also participate in agricultural activities and other value chains, even though their participation is often invisible. Transversalizar el enfoque de género responsivo en el contexto de la adaptación al cambio climático implica entonces iniciar con el análisis de género que permita identificar brechas de género, focalizar estas brechas y programar acciones concretas orientadas a cerrarlas, eh, asignando los recursos necesarios para su implementación y por supuesto darle seguimiento mediante indicadores. Llevo alrededor de 16 años de experiencia en trabajo en temas relativos a género e inclusión social en el ámbito de las organizaciones sociales y la cooperación internacional. Derivado de esta experiencia, puedo indicar que para contribuir a cerrar brechas de género en un proyecto de adaptación al cambio climático, es fundamental partir del análisis de género para entender la particular situación, condición y la posición de las mujeres en un contexto de desigualdad la cual se profundiza con los impactos del cambio climático debido a la vulnerabilidad social, económica y ambiental preexistentes. Por ejemplo, son las mujeres las responsables de ir a buscar agua, colectar leña, buscar alimentos en el bosque y cuando los recursos escasean, asumen eh, una mayor carga de trabajo doméstico. Esto impacta eh, la seguridad alimentaria, incluso agudiza la situación de violencia de género debido al acceso limitado y el poco control que tienen las mujeres sobre los recursos. 
As many other colleagues, I am not a gender expert, yet my mission is to ensure that migrants actually bring about benefits for women. In a region where women and girls are traditionally marginalized, where they are confined to rules that have to do mostly with reproduction and household care. So it is very important for me to understand how women and girls actually participate in agriculture and natural resources conservation, and to understand how we can ensure this role is recognized and women are empowered so that they can get greater benefits for their very specific contribution. I need to understand the barriers that hinder women from reaching their full potential and make sure that our brands contribute to lifting those barriers. Para apoyar el trabajo de los profesionales de la conservación que no son expertos en género, se han generado herramientas de análisis que les permiten incorporar estas consideraciones en su quehacer técnico. Una vez realizado el análisis, se entiende mejor el rol de las mujeres, sus aportes y las barreras que enfrentan para participar o beneficiarse de las oportunidades de restauración o de adaptación basada en ecosistemas. Pero sobre todo, permite incorporar las perspectivas e intereses diferenciados de mujeres y hombres. Esto permite definir acciones afirmativas e inclusivas como el desarrollo de capacidades de liderazgo, promover su acceso a eh, asistencia técnica y recursos financieros, vinculándolas a cadenas de valor para que los beneficios no sean solamente ambientales, sino además tengan un impacto social, cultural, económico en la vida de las mujeres, los hombres y de las comunidades. Los principales retos a los que nos enfrentamos se deben a que las mujeres pueden ser parte de esas estructuras organizativas locales, pero no ejercen puestos de poder y no son vistas como figuras de tomas de decisiones. Las mujeres carecen de conocimientos técnicos, por lo que no pueden participar y opinar con seguridad y no son tomadas en serio. Sin embargo, pues el COVID no ha permitido mejorar las condiciones de las mujeres en campo, ha sido un factor más para que su participación pues, se diluya y los hombres no permiten que las mujeres participen en estas actividades ya que ellas son las responsables del hogar y de cuidar a, eso, a los miembros de la familia, lo que hace mucho más riesgoso si ellas se contagian, ya que no podrán cuidar de los demás y el contagio sería por participar en actividades no lucrativas. Además que ellas son responsables de velar por los niños, con las clases online o tareas en casa, por lo que pueden asistir a actividades hasta que finalicen con sus responsabilidades en el hogar, en horarios a partir de las 4 de la tarde en adelante, siendo esta una de las principales causas que impiden su participación en proyectos de adaptación al cambio climático. Women, and especially girls in rural areas, are part of the most vulnerable populations in our country. It is our work to empower them and ensure that they directly benefit from all our initiatives. Pero como parte del manejo integrado de cuencas y el fortalecimiento de capacidades, es nuestro deber promover la equidad de género dentro de la conformación de las estructuras de los consejos de microcuenca, por lo que incidimos en que las mujeres puedan quedar impuestos con tomas de decisiones dentro de la organización del consejo de microcuenca y les brindamos capacidades técnicas antes de la conformación para que en el momento en que se realice esta estructura ellas estén seguras de que su participación será oportuna y enriquecedora. If we are to achieve the goal of the project, women can't be left behind. We need to define specific strategies to involve them and make sure their voices are heard. My name is Raquel Sigüenza. I am the IUCN's country representative in Guatemala. Hi, my name is Jill Bader and I am a grants manager at IUCN in Guatemala. Hola, mi nombre es Marisela Mendes, soy <laughs> Apologies, I think we were so mesmerized by the video, we wanted to see it again. Um, but uh, I, I wanted, I know two of our panelists need to run, but before you do, I just wanted to invite you uh, for a second to the to the floor, if that's okay, because I have one request, and I'll, I'll let you know what the request is as you're walking through, so you can think about it. Um, before we, and we know you have a very difficult agenda today, but we wanted to ask you if you could summarize in one sentence what is that one takeaway message that you want to leave the audience with, right? Um, so think about it. If you only had one idea to share with the rest of us, 
that keeps on following us through Gender Day at COP uh, today. What is that message? Uh, Ms. Fuentes, uh, can I invite you to, to share first? Thank you. No, many, many thanks for posing this uh, challenge because it's one of the key questions to be sorted out and resolved at COP and not only at COP uh, in life uh, because we need implementation on the ground uh, to realize also the uh, huge potential that women uh, have. And as part of that, uh, the key uh, takeaway uh, that I would like the audience uh, to get from here and, and also um, everyone uh, to take it home and try to work on that basis is the role of uh, women as agents of change. I think that came true in all the interventions and also uh, that relates to the key role and central role that they have in a society in terms of uh, uh, the keepers of knowledge, uh, the ones also that are in charge of the management of resources, uh, the ones that can educate as well. Uh, we have a, a big role to play when it comes to education of future generations. So that role as agent of change is also, also intergenerational. So we need to work on that basis uh, for women to be a part of the response to the climate challenge. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Rexner, before you, you go, um, what is that? piece of advice, that one idea that you want us to, keep, to share with today. Thank you very much. Well, if it's a message to decision makers and politicians, I would say it is your duty to understand and get uh, or take an interest in how climate change affects women and girls in the world, not least indigenous women for the reasons you mentioned and all sisters on the screen. But it's also your duty to see how women are part of the solution everybody is looking for and to see women as the decision makers they have the right to be. Perfect. Thank you very much. And I think we can have a round of applause and thank the two speakers uh, for their participation. Thank you both. And Ms. Corpus, it looks like it's becoming cozy between you and me, because it's just the two of us now in the panel. Um, but uh, before making this a one-on-one -on -one conversation, which I would love, uh, perhaps we can open the floor for questions from the audience. And um, if there is anyone with questions from the floor, because otherwise we can engage just in a one-on-one -on -one dialogue. And Anita, thank you for helping with the mic. Yes, of course. Please, uh, if you could say your name. Yes. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. My name is uh, Kautho Kuli. I'm a principal lecturer in marketing, so I'm an academic. So uh, what's next? And uh, how can academic women can help solving the issues? Are there funds we can apply for to conduct research, collect data, and help to solve those issues? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to respond? I think that academics play a really important role in um, it particularly in monitoring, but also in, um, in developing the scientific basis, you know, I, scientific, scientists in particular, the scientific basis for some of the policy decisions that are taken here. Um, now, I, I would like to apologize because I'm not aware of specific funds that you could apply for, but I think um, taking a gender lens in our academic work is important. I myself uh, am a lecturer on indigenous management of resources at the university where I live, and um, you know, it's it's since it's indigenous peoples, that's it's uh, natural that I talk about indigenous peoples. But I think it's very important to introduce a gender lens in how we teach and in how we write um, our academic papers. Um, for indigenous peoples, um, in my experience with our partners, the acad the academe has played an important role in um, conducting research at the community level. So. For instance, for indigenous peoples that would like to engage in um, results-based payments, we have a partner in Australia 
um, that practices cultural burning, and this is with both men and women. Um, and the only reason that they were able to show how much carbon is avoided by engaging in cultural burning rather than waiting for the wildfire season to consume everything in the, in the, um, in the area um, was because of the academics. They were the ones that conducted the study. Um, also, in mining communities in the Philippines, we rely on academics to um, to conduct the studies, to help us conduct the studies on the impact of mining chemicals in the soil. And you know, we found out that there was a differential impact on indigenous women. For example, when the chemicals reached the, the paddy fields, the rice fields, the women's uh, nails started falling off, no? and there was some impact on reproductive uh, capacity. So yeah, so that's <laughs> the role that, um, it's a very important role that academics play. Thank you. Um, and indeed, academia has a very important role to play. You also have a way of communicating with policymakers um, that can definitely bridge exactly what the reality uh, that Ms. Corpus was, was talking about uh, and put it into a different language that's easier uh, to understand. And one of the gaps that we see the most, um, again, uh, in terms of understanding what actions can be taken on the ground come from lack of information. So again, academia, whenever you can do your research, if you include a gender lens, then you're doubling the amount of information and understand that we can have a situation. And I see another hand. OK, I see two hands. So first here in the front, Anita, and then on the, on the back. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you. My name is, uh, OK. <laughs> yeah, my name is Abna Asmanin. I'm from Ghana, West Africa. OK. <laughs> Um, luckily for me, I'm in both academia and in practice. And I realized that, first of all, research is expensive. And academics can't just, we can't sort of conjure the resources to do these very necessary research. So the issue of uh, resourcing um, research must perhaps be considered or talked about on various platforms. Um, but I want to come to the point of us as um, people who generate knowledge. Not all the knowledge you generate seems to be, first of all, appreciated. On the different platforms that we find ourselves, particularly if you're on a platform where policy is made, yes, they, when there's a need and a policy must be made, the politicians would have to move forward and be quite uh, responsive to the problems. And so sometimes there's, um, they are a bit slow in trying to incorporate research, which might take a bit of time before you incorporate. By the time the policy comes out for implementation, it's a bit too late. So that's one. But um, as back to my role in Ghana, one of the things we realized, or my organization is the Just One Group of Companies, is the biggest waste management organization in Ghana and a few African countries. But I also teach. What I've realized from academia is that even students these days don't want to read. <laughs> I don't know if it, they want the easy way out. How at first people would, you know, consumption is difficult. So what we are trying to do is as part of the organization's advocacy, we have come up with a TV program where we have environmental, env environmental and sanitation issues bordering on um, health being showcased and I'm anchoring that because I feel that when people, ordinary people, anchor such programs, they don't bring the depth of knowledge that they should. But the essence of that program is to let um, issues of climate change be taken to households. Let the women consume the knowledge in very digestible um, forms, like using the local language, you know? Because as part of the handicaps that we have, educational attainment happens to be low for women, and so if we don't try to bridge the issues, the issue of climate change may be up there where implementers or and um, change agents who are relevant will be out there and there will be a gap. So this is my contribution here. Thank you. Yeah, good morning, everybody. My English is not so good, so I hope I can express myself. So... <laughs> 
In Guatemala, it's very difficult. The signs have a male face. And it's difficult for us to make science. So the question is, what happened or how you take the traditional knowledge and the different way to make science from the communities and match to the academy? Because I am an academic scientist, but I have difficult because I believe in different ways to make science from the communities and especially from the knowledge and the methodology that the women use from the uh, indigenous communities. So um, sometimes it's a big it's, I don't know, it's okay. It's a big gap between the traditional knowledge and the methodology that the indigenous woman has and the academic methodology because they sell like the, the science that we, we make from the communities is not science. So we have this biggest problem in Guatemala in how you, how you can think that we can r r resolve this pro uh, pro problem. Well, Ms. Corpus, I think especially the last one was directed to, at you. <laughs> so maybe you want to take both, and then maybe I can just sort of compliment uh, on the first one. Well, there, there are um, very promising developments at the international level, actually. So for example, the Intergovernmental Panel, Science Policy Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPBES, they have an indigenous knowledge uh, task force. And they've acknowledged um, you know, two models. One is co-production of knowledge between scientists, Western scientists, and traditional knowledge holders. And um, they, you know, it was a struggle at first because the model was that the scientific knowledge would be used to validate traditional knowledge, no? to prove that it's valid. But now they're acknowledging that traditional knowledge has a value of its own and that um, there's no need for Western scientists to, um, to validate. So it increasingly, traditional knowledge is becoming recognized as, um, as a science in itself at the international level. And you know, the hope is that it trickles down in the university where I work. Um, there is a Cordillera Study Center, that's the region where we are. And you know, uh, there's a lot of production of traditional knowledge, uh, um, public uh, research and publications on traditional knowledge. And increasingly, they are becoming um, uh, published in peer-reviewed journals, no? because that's very important for academics. But I think it's important that this policy space has opened up at the international level, and it can be invoked at the university so that dialogue can be opened up between traditional knowledge holders and indigenous peoples. Then, of course, here at the climate change um, space, we have the local communities and indigenous peoples platform, and they have a facilita facilitative working group that brought in four knowledge holders per uh, indigenous region and there were important activities unfortunately the last one was yesterday um, but you know this is to open up spaces also for exchanges of knowledge between the, the uh, climate activists climate experts and climate scientists and indigenous peoples because you know the the empirical findings are that indigenous peoples are doing a good job no if you look at the satellite data you see that indigenous territories have the best forest cover and also the IUCN findings showing that indigenous um, territories harbor in bi biodiversity very good biodiversity. So yeah, so my advice would be to take all of these um, developments at the international level and to, in order to open up dialogues between scienti scientists and academics and traditional knowledge holders. I could talk a lot about this. There are some approaches we've taken in the Philippines, schools of living traditions where the, the knowledge holders are the professors, and even um, universities that bring in uh, knowledge holders to lecture in some of their subjects. But there are many different approaches, and I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you. I think I could listen to you the whole day. But <laughs> thanks for, for the pause. Um, you just triggered something which is not necessarily in the academia um, sphere, but um, I'm a very well aware of a project that is about knowledge exchange. And this is about exchanging the traditional knowledge of the indigenous women from Ayacucho in Peru and bringing that harvesting of water uh, techniques into um, dry area in Costa Rica. 
And so this is not academia, but I do think that there is very important if people who do not have, who are not indigenous, who do not necessarily have that special connection to the water, can be exposed to the tradition and the knowledge, because what I have seen is that then there is an increased understanding and value and recognition too, right? So in, in, I, I would also suggest to try and open this these conversations because what we have um, experienced is how people can also start to understand each other better just by this sharing of, of knowledge and recognition that you know there are other ways, maybe even better ways uh, than what we're used to. So I, I think it's also part of opening that conversation. And if you allow me to take that as a sideway into the, um, the, the question on communication, I think it is absolutely true. I mean, one of the challenges of working in this space is that we need to understand what kind of language, what kind of, how we're packaging the message. Because it is not the same when we're talking to a policymaker that needs to understand what are the larger impacts than when we're talking at a household level. Because also the way that the information is translated, that the experience is conveyed, has to change. And that is whether, you know, it is just by understanding what could be the most important means of communication, but also what is the most important language. Um, whether it's pictorial, whether we need to translate our conversation into different mother tongues, all of that has a, an implication and it is absolutely essential um, to do. I, we may have one time for one question, if there is appetite from the floor. Mm. Just one more? <laughs> no, you say want to add that maybe, I don't, I don't know, maybe we can start to, to talk about the in science from the traditional knowledge and give this name because if we don't, I don't know if it's a syntaxis problem because sometimes if we don't call by your name the things, we don't can recognize the value that have. So I think, okay, it's a traditional knowledge, but it's science. So science from the traditional knowledge. I think it's, it's, it's important to call. Thank you. Yeah. No, brilliant. And I do, words have meaning and weight. And I think that you're making an excellent point in calling it uh, science. It is science. And we should acknowledge that in our conversations. Thank you very much for that. Um, yes, Anita. Can I ask something or say I don't know? Absolutely. If I don't know if it's an ask or a comment. I don't know. I'm a little bit. Um, I'm kind of happy and uh, cautiously hopeful about the data that was presented. Um, it's interesting to, sh to see how it has been changing in the last five years and how um, data on women is starting to show in these NDCs um, and, and the little chunk of data on indigenous women. I, I think it's important and, and I'm, I'm hopeful, but I say cautiously hopeful because I'm wondering how is this data expressed in the reality? How is this data collected and ensure that it's not just a check checkbox of um, tagging number of women in a workshop or number of women in an event or number of women in a capacity building session? How tangible is that data and how can we know how tangible is that data on the ground um, in terms of how can we ensure that that data is actually expre expressing action on the ground regarding the real meaningful involvement of women and specifically indigenous women on climate action, on building communities resilience, on adaptation measures, in all these processes around climate action. Um, because I think for too long, research has also been like a tick box kind of research. So, so, so I, I, I like that the data is starting to show up, but that, is my, that, that remains my, my, the puzzle in my head. 
um, because I come from an indigenous community in Belize, even though I, I work with IUCN, but I come from an indigenous community where for too long I've seen that workshops on empowerment of women and capacity of women on, on, on climate change and, and then, or on red, and, and, and the government office comes and runs a workshop and counts the number of women, and then this is expressed in data in these NDCs. And, and it's not so impactful in terms of ensuring that women are actually key stakeholders key decision makers and driving the processes in their community. So that is my, my worry. That, 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 that is the piece of the puzzle in my head. That's why I say I'm cautiously hopeful about this data, but I also question myself and, and, and question those processes from where this data comes. You know what I mean? And, 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 and that's, that's why I said, I don't know if it's a question or it's just a comment, but this is the experience that I bring from my communities. And I've been in these workshops, you know, where they ask me, um, can, the, can the elder women in your village, can the traditional holders in your village come and share with us? And then at the end of the day, we are a little check on the box, you know? So, so I'm just cautious about that. Yes, I completely understand where you're coming from, because a, a lot of times, no, uh, but, well, just to say that the study was actually looking at the NDC, so this is at the stage of planning, no? And it's easy to do, you just search for the word indigenous, and then you, you look how many times indigenous are, is mentioned, but that's not the, the part that matters, right? Of course, it's a commitment on the part of those who develop the NDCs that they will address indigenous peoples and indigenous women. And, but the more, more important part is the follow-up, no? Looking at how it's implemented and what the impacts are on indigenous peoples and, uh, you know, climate action. Um, I think it's important that we get the indicators right so that we're able to capture um, the impact on indigenous peoples. And I think it's important that indigenous peoples themselves are able to monitor these indicators, no? So in terms of indicators for indigenous peoples, we've been supporting work to develop biocultural indicators for indigenous peoples because, you know, sometimes their indicators are different from mainstream. So typically you have GDP, income, reduction of poverty. But if you ask indigenous peoples, what's important for them is the ability to access their territories, their ability to carry out, continue carrying out their rituals. So all of these things. So we have to get the indicators right so that it really reflects the change that is happening on the ground. And then we have to, as I said, bring indigenous peoples to actually monitor themselves these indicators and how it's um, uh, playing out in their communities. Thanks. Absolutely, I think that that's the, the key and I'm very happy to hear it from you. Um, one of the aspects, and again, of course, the report only looks at the written documents that are publicly available on the UNFCCC website. Um, but then the next challenge is to actually go on the ground and verify, I mean, the, the monitoring and evaluation with a gender perspective, um, if you remember the graphics, was not among the highest um, elements that we found, right? So there is a lot of homework uh, for, for countries when we're going back home and making sure that there is a, a robust ma &E system that links to either the, the statistics office, but in the case of indigenous peoples, I think, and local uh, rural communities, uh, the fact that it should be involved and in producing and, and doing this monitoring, the social monitoring of, of activities. Um, I think we are uh, running out of time, but before we say goodbye, now I want to give you the challenge that I gave the other two speakers, of course. <laughs> so you've had the opportunity to, you know, um, to listen, also to have um, this additional input uh, from the conversation that we just had. And um, Ms. Corpus, I just wanted to ask you, what is that last piece of advice, message, that idea that you want us to take from uh, this event of today? The floor is yours. Well, 
when listening to the final messages of the other two panelists, I just act, I agree completely with what they said, and I just wanted to in, insert indigenous <laughs> for women because, um, but for my sentence, it's not completely original, but indigenous peoples and particularly indigenous women need to be central partners in solutions to climate change. So I hope, um, and the evidence is there <laughs> for, for um, including indigenous peoples as full partners. So yeah, that's my sense. And thank, thank you. you very much. And I'll invite you to give her a very strong round of applause. Thank you for those of you who have been here with us uh, live um, at the GCF Pavilion. Um, thank you for the GCF for helping us uh, organize this event. For those of you at the Streamline, thank you for, for watching. We hope that you enjoyed. Uh, for us, it's been an absolute pleasure to have this brilliant lineup and personally amazing to have the opportunity to speak with you. So thank you very, uh, very much, everyone, and have a lovely re rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>